sponsors. <laughs> All right, um, so I'd like to introduce Magic Cook. And I totally didn't pronounce that right, did I? No, I didn't, and that's OK. <laughs> We've established we've known each other for 12 years. Yes, we have. And I still can't pronounce your last name. Uh. Anyway, um, so Matya is a uh, orbital dynamicist. Uh, he did his PhD at Cornell University with Joe Burns. Uh, he then spent time at UBC and uh, as a Seton National Fellow, in fact, uh, yeah. and then time at Harvard. He is now currently at SETI. Uh, and in 2014, Mathieu won the Harold C. Urey Prize, uh, which is the prize annually awarded by the American Astronomical Society Division of Planetary Science uh, to recognize excellence in an early career researcher. And Mathieu will tell us about why the moon is extra super awesome. Yes, thank you, Krista. So thank you for inviting me. It's nice to be back here. I came a couple of times when I was a CETA National Fellow. Um, so my name is Matija Chuk, for, for the recording. Uh, and I want to tell you all about the tidal evolution of the moon from a high obliquity fast spinning Earth. And to get there, I have to tell you first, uh, what did we think about the lunar formation before all this work? Uh, about some previous work by me and Sarah Stewart uh, on the same topic. And then how there is this thing with lunar inclination, which has been a problem since forever and is still a problem and how that influenced us in uh, formulating this solution. And then I'll tell you about the actual paper that's right now um, being submitted. Um, so you all heard about the giant impact theory of lunar formation. And the mainstream of the theory this, that kind of crystallized by 2000 is that a Mars-sized impactor hit Earth during the end of the formation. Um, there, was an, there was an oblique Im uh, impact that ejected mantle material from both the impactor and the Earth, but mostly material from, material from the impactor. Um, and uh, you create a, a moon that's close to Earth, um, which has then evolved tidally out because of the tidal forces within Earth. So the moon is slowing down Earth's rotation and gaining angular momentum, migrating out. And the original um, rotational period of Earth had to be five hours because that's what comes from the angular momentum conservation. Uh, and originally, most of the angular momentum was in Earth's rotation, and most of it now is in lunar orbit because it grew so much. So this is uh, one of the classic papers about lunar formation by Robin Canop and Eric Asfog from 2001. These are views from the top, except the last one, which is from the side. It shows the disk forming. It's the, la it's, it's the last picture from the side. And you have an impactor coming in, hitting, and disrupting. Earth is much less disrupted than the impactor. Material goes into orbit. Most of it comes from the impactor. So to some extent, what you have here is a collisional capture, because uh, impactor is disrupted, but much of its material stays in orbit. So why do we think this is not exactly how it happened anymore? The biggest problem is the composition, that isotopic signature of the moon, that is the ratios of different isotopes of the same elements, are the same as in Earth. Now, if you look at meteorites from Mars or from Vesta, they all have distinct uh, isotopic signatures. You can tell uh, that all of their meteorites are one way, uh, regardless of the type, and just like all Earth rocks, together with moon rocks are the same. And if impactor was an independent planetary body, you would expect it to be as different from Earth as Mars is. Then the other problem, which was kind of semi-ignored for a long time, is that the moon has significant orbital inclination. Right now it's five degrees. It has been somewhat uh, higher in the past, and later we'll come to the point of how much higher it was. Um, and this is not what you expect. If the moon formed from a flat disk, Regardless of its tidal evolution, uh, at all times it should have stayed in the Laplace plane, the plane around which the orbit would precess, and end up in a planar orbit around, uh, in the ecliptic, which is not the case. Um, and then the last one wasn't a big deal, but to have this kind of impact, uh, to have a giant impact hypothesis work, you needed a very slow impactor, because after all, what you have is a collisional capture. Um, and this, this is not what naturally happens in terrestrial planet formation. So it was kind of more of an indicator that something was wrong with the story. So this is one of the plots of oxygen isotopes. You plot minor, like these are ratios of eight, oxygen 18 and 17 um, against each other. And they would, they would, in different rocks, they would 
uh, cluster along different lines, but for the Earth-Moon system and Mars, they clearly cluster along different lines. So, and the error bars are about as big as the symbols in this plot. And this is not even as the newest paper. There, there are newer papers with small error bars. So definitely Mars is significantly different. Um, and error bars are at least 10 times smaller than the difference. Um, so another kink to the composition problem is the tungsten isotopes of Earth and the Moon. So if you um, think of oxygen isotopes, it's just like what kinds of planetesimals you start with and how you mix and match them. Uh, tungsten isotopes evolve over time because uh, tungsten is partially radiogenic from uh, hafnium. So, and the time scale is comparable to the time scale of terrestrial planet formation. So two planets that started with exactly the same material uh, in planetesimals, will, if they evolve at different rates, they grow at different times, uh, that is their cores form at different times because tungsten will sink to the core and uh, the hafnium will not, uh, will have different tungsten uh, isotopic signature in the mantle and earth and moon are the same, which is really interesting. And the easiest way to, um, to understand this is that the Earth and the Moon formed, the, the Moon formed from Earth's mantle at some point. And this is from the simulation I showed before by Robin Canop. Um, they kind of, she made the Earth and Moon transparent and showed where the material that ends up in the, sorry, these are impactor and the, and the Earth, where the impact, that, where the material that ends up in the Moon is on these two bodies before the impact. Um, so you can see throughout. So the, the red stuff is what escapes, but the yellow stuff is what goes into the disk that makes the moon. And the yellow stuff is mostly in the impactor, and which once again comes from the fact that what mostly you have is a capture of material from the impactor during collision. So um, this was the state in 2012 uh, when Sarah Stewart and I proposed a new solution. So we started out with the idea that if uh, moon looks like Earth's mantle in composition, maybe it is derived from Earth's mantle. And this remind, reminds people of uh, George Darwin's fission hypothesis, except to fission Earth, you need to spin it much faster than five hours, which was dictated by the angular momentum conservation. So there are two questions. One, that question to me, it's a dynamics question. Can you lose angular momentum from Earth-Moon system post-formation? So if you have a faster spinning Earth early on, you can make moon one way and then you lose angular momentum and evolve into the present state. And this will have to involve giant impacts because it, there, giant impact hypothesis was not one off thing. We know that that's how terrestrial planets grow. Um, so the question is, the second question, which was question for Sarah, uh, is if we have this higher spin Earth, could we form a moon that's Earth-like? And first I'll answer the question number two. Uh, Sarah Stewart ran this uh, uh, impact simulation. This is similar to Robin Canham's previous simulations, and um, Earth is much more disrupted in this uh, in this simulation because we have a body hitting Earth that is fast spinning before the impact, hitting at a very high velocity, 20 kilometers per second, um, and we get the disk in the uh, in the end. But here is the provenance of material: red is stuff that escapes, and the yellow is the stuff that ends up in a disk. So this is end state projected back onto the bodies in the beginning. And ma most of the yellow material, that is the disk material, st starts out as part of Earth. So in the end, when you mix, when you look at the difference in composition between the fraction of the impactor and fraction of proto-Earth, in Earth and the disk, it's, uh, it's consistent with the error bars on the isotopic plots I showed you. I think most of it gets incorporated. Which means you change the composition of the Yes, so th there are two things you're doing here. You're contributing Earth material to the disk, but you also pollute Earth with the impactor. So the difference between final compositions of Earth and the Moon was within the error bars for the data. Light blue is the stuff that uh, ends up in lower mantle. Uh, Sarah cared about that because of the uh, intricacy of the mantle composition of the Earth, which is, for astrophysicists, second order problem, kind of. And I don't quite understand it either. Um, so my question is, how, did, how could Earth-Moon system lose uh, 
angular momentum. So first thing we tried was a core mantle friction because you can actually, if you have a differential precession of a core and a mantle, you can lose angular momentum. Didn't work in this case. Um, then we tried the evection resonance between the sun and the moon, and that was the basis of a 2012 paper. Uh, another thing that works are solar perturbations on a highly inclined system. And I'm gonna come to that later, that's the new paper. But first I'm gonna go through the evection resonance paper. Um, so evection resonance is a semi-secular resonance, which is a resonance between the precession of the lunar orbit and Earth's orbit around the sun. Now, this is kind of a very old style plot because it's Ptolemaic, that means Earth is in the, in the middle. But this is kind of how it works because you can imagine sun going around Earth. That, that way, the, the Earth's orbit, well, the heliocentric orbit and lunar orbit are concentric so you can make angles easier. So it's the, uh, it's the fact that the precession of the lunar or orbit, the whole orbit moving around in space and Earth's motion around the sun, which is just shown here as suns around Earth, gets to be in resonance. You get the same, uh, you get them locked together. And this is a result of a simulation. So here is the same major axis of the moon. Moon goes out, gets stuck, sinks back in, and then gets out of the resonance and comes out. So what happened here? Well, resonance uh, happens here. The moon acquires huge eccentricity in the resonance, but then uh, reaches equilibrium where the lunar tides move it inwards and damping of eccentricity prevents further growth. And it gets out of the resonance because uh, you get to the point where the orbit has shrunk so much and it's eccentric that the, and the Earth's rotation has slowed down that the moon is getting to be almost super synchronous at perigee. When it, when it passes the perigee, it's almost catching up with Earth. So the tides cannot push it into the resonance anymore and the resonance breaks. Um, spin period slows down. Uh, quite a bit, and this is the resonant argument, just to show you that it's actually in resonance. And here is the movie of the, so this is from the paper for uh, three years ago. So what happens here is that m this is the time when it's stuck in the resonance where the perigee is 90 degrees away from the sun. The movie is in a rotating reference frame. So this is the time th that it's in the resonance, and you can see the orbit shrinks because the the location of the resonance moves inwards as, moon, as the Earth slows down, and once the resonance breaks, you get the free precession, which means that the perigee can be in any direction relative to the sun. And we end up with the right angular momentum. I can... So we, in this case, the precession of the moon's orbit is driven by the Earth's J2? Yes, yeah, but it's still close to Earth. This is few Earth radii away. It's still driven primarily by uh, J2. Of course, there is a resonant term that uh, makes locking possible. Um, so it has to lock in this direction or the uh, up. It has to be 90 degrees away from the sun. Um, and uh, besides the momentum that was about 170 something percent, and you'll see in the end ends up uh, being about the same as now. And the nice thing in this paper was that this limit when you are synchronous at perigee gives you about the right angle momentum. And that's why the floor of the simulations, like if you start the different amounts of angle momentum, uh, this is in, in natural units. So one would be Earth falling apart or something. Um, you end up with the same floor of the angular momentum because that's when you're synchronous at, at perigee. Um, and it depends a little bit on the tidal properties of Earth and the Moon. So you have this sweet spot where this tidal parameter A, the way we describe it, which is just the ratio of tidal properties of Earth and the Moon, is around one. You have this sweet spot that you reach this, that you reach this floor, constant floor of ending momentum, and for the larger or greater uh, tidal uh, A's, uh, you do never reach that floor. You never go to the absolute end of the tidal evolution. So you need to uh, fine tune tidal parameters a bit. Okay, so that was our 2012 paper. So what has happened since? There was another paper on the evection resonance by Wisdom and Tian, and they found a s s different solution where eccentricities are lower and you never actually enter the resonance because the damping prevents you from entering the resonance, but the end result is the same. You lose angular momentum. Then there was a big uh, science paper by Young and collaborators who reanalyzed earth, and, uh, earth rocks, moon rocks, and try to figure out if there is a difference between Earth and the Moon, and now it's, has, the pendulum has swung back after a couple of papers that said that they finally can tell the difference, has gone back to them being exactly the same, and error bars keep, shrink, keep shrinking. Um, 
So it's not even clear that our paper can explain that. So far it looks like the 2012 paper can, but it's getting to the point that even if you have a very lucky collision in which you kick out lots of Earth material, it might not really work. And then we never address lunar inclination. Um, so there was a series of works by Irina Chen, who was working with Francis Nemo in Santa Cruz, and she found that people have been ignoring lunar obliquity tides for the longest time. That is, the tides within the moon, raised by Earth, that damp, uh, that, that are raised because of the moon has forced obliquity, and they damp lunar inclination. And these are very important. And all the previous uh, tidal evolution history, starting with Goldrake, have ignored this. So what is this Cassini state I talk about? Ignore the green arrow here. It shows something else. And I couldn't find a nicer picture. But um, for a satellite in synchronous rotation, like the moon, um, if the orbit has no inclination, uh, the spin axis would be perpendicular to orbit too. But if the orbit has an inclination, which means that it precesses around some Laplace plane, then um, the, uh, if, unless, the uh, spin axis precesses extremely fast and follows the orbit at all times, as the orbit precesses, the spin will not be able to catch up. So you have to induce a forced inclination, for, sorry, forced obliquity, so that precession of the spin around the orbit and precession of the orbit around the Laplace plane will be in, uh, in phase. And there are a couple of solutions like that, uh, and they're all called Cassini states. And they're distinguished by the ecliptic normal. Well, in this case, it's ecliptic normal, but what it is is a Laplace plane normal. The, pla the, the line around which the orbit normal precesses is coplanar with the orbit normal in, and, spin, uh, and spin axis. And this arrangement, where the spin axis is on the other side of the Laplace plane normal from orbit normal, is so-called Cassini state 2. The other way you could have it is that the spin axis is here, and that's Cassini state 1. Um, and they, they are stable in different regimes. And as the precession happens, so the, uh, the forced obliquity, which is this angle uh, between the orbit and the lunar spin, is such that as the orbit normal precesses around the Laplace plane normal, the spin precesses around it on the other side, and they always stay in the same line. So you have to f force the obliquity, basically, to allow you this, th th this uh, uh, collin collinear arrangement is permanent. So why do you call Cassini states? I think uh, Cassini, I think it was the first of the Cassinis, first uh, made some laws about how the spin axis of the, he figured out that this is how it was for the moon, that the, the, <coughs> the lunar spin axis had to be collinear with the ecliptic normal and orbit normal. So he expressed it as three laws, as people did in those days. But then, um, the yeah, but he figured out the principle, geometric principle, I think. Because it, he was a Newtonian, I think. So I don't think he could have sorted that out. But Stan Peel actually reinvented Cassini sta states. And uh, he generalized them and so on. But people called them Cassini states. I'm surprised. So, so all these streets, so they are yeah. not So orbit is, pre orbit is precessing around the ecliptic, and spin is precessing around the orbit. Well, what happens is that the, it tries to precess around the, the, this is what they really do in real space, but the center of the curve, instantaneous curvature of the lunar spin is the orbit. But the orbit moves around faster than the spin does. So as spin ends up being having a smaller circle. Yeah. Well, it's just the instantaneous curvature is around orbit. And then the, uh, but you can see that the spin is always closer to the ecliptic, which is kind of, I can show you how it looks. Yeah, in, this, is a, uh, this is Bill Ward's paper from 75, which was the kind of the paper on Cassini State of the Moon. So, it's weird how they plot obliquity up and down, but what you have, uh, like positive and negative, but what you have here, what they have is 
positive is on this side of the orbit and negative on this side of the orbit because it's a, it's a one degree of degree of freedom problem, right? Because they're all collinear in the Cassini states. So then they, they, they call D on this side, just like the moon had, call it positive uh, obliquity and on this side is negative. So this is what it, Y axis means here, basically. It's in the plane where all these are. And uh, so this is the orbit normal and this is the ecliptic here. Um, you cannot follow, I mean, this part doesn't make sense because Laplace plane is not constant, but it doesn't matter. And if you go very far from, from uh, Earth, the, the spin precession is slower and slower compared to orbit precession because further you are from Earth, Moon's or, uh, spin precession is going to be slower because Earth is the perturber. However, the perturber on the orbit is the Sun. So further you are from Earth, faster the precession is. So on this side, the spin precession dominates, and that's where we are now, and that's where you have state two. When you are close to the planet, spin precession is really fast, uh, and orbit precession is dominated by uh, J2, but generally spin precession is faster for pretty much everything. So you have state one, where uh, spin precess is fast enough to keep up with the orbit. So the spin is very close to orbit and stays close to it. And since the moon moved from here to here, it had to go through flip from one side to the other. And close to the, and the transition is when the spin and orbit precession rates are similar. Uh, and you get large, uh, in large uh, forest obliquities. And the idea is that you had this transition where, and this is when moon was 34 um, Earth radii from, uh, from Earth, where the obliquity got big and then Earth uh, moon kind of flipped over and then started with a large obliquity in Cassini state 2, which then damped over time. This assumes that there is no back reaction of, uh, of the spin on the orbit. So what, this is what we did. With, we did do put in uh, back reaction. So we started with a bunch of uh, state, with, with a bunch of initial conditions. Basically what we do here is try to match the present state which is inclination of five degrees, starting with different uh, initial eccentricity, uh, sorry, inclinations, and obliquity is, is just forced. We just follow Cassini state. And what we use for Earth and the uh, Moon, well, these are the present love numbers, that how squishy or how, um, how deformable Earth and Moon are. So we use the current numbers. This is generally the later part of the tidal evolution. Uh, so after moon formed and cooled down a bit. And we did three cases. We did the moon uh, with um, the uh, different cues and cues so high that basically there has no obliquity tides. So if you have a case with no obliquity tides and you extend back the lunar evolution, you end up the eccentricity, sorry, the inclination was about the same as it is now. And this is a, a, pretty much what I showed you before in, the, in this paper, because this is what inclination is, difference between the Laplace plane and orbit normal. But if you start including lunar damp damping, and this is, by the way, the Q, Q of the moon right now is 38. Uh, yeah, it's just number, 38. So this is not as dissipated as it is now. You get huge dampings uh, of inclination at Cassini state transition. So depending on what you assume in the normal rate, in the reasonable ranges of lunar, um, of the lunar tidal friction, you end up with lunar inclinations being 20 or 30 degrees before Cassini state transition. Why? Because the obliquity tides are huge. The, usually we ignore them because obliquities of many objects like giant planet satellites are small. But when you go through this quasi resonance of Cassini state transition, you get huge induced uh, obliquities which then uh, it's, a, it's a equivalent to eccentricity tides, except that there is a factor obliquity over inclination squared. So you can see how, uh, how this is one regime where obliquity tides cannot be ignored. Uh, so, and, so you can't get back to a zero inclination state? Yeah, before people thought it was just like five, 10 degrees problem, but now it's like 30 degrees out of the plane originally, at least just before the transition. We, we don't know when it originated. So this is, a, this is a problem. And then um, 
these are the different um, ways people try to explain inclination before, and most of them would not work with the with a 30 degree inclination. Um, I'll, I won't discuss them because I don't think they're relevant. This is the most recent paper. I can talk about it later a bit. I have a slide. But the thing that really, that was an explanation of, of inclination because it wasn't about our system, but that really got us excited was this paper by Keiko Atobe and Shigeru Eida, who found that just studying imaginary extrasolar planets that are Earth-like, they found that planets with moons if they start out at high obliquity, they can acquire, moons can acquire high inclinations. So this is one thing they show. Actually here they have moon acquiring inclination so high it drops back. This is the uh, obliquity of the planet. Um, and this is the inclination relative to the ecliptic of the moon. So they get to the Cassini state transition, sorry, Laplace plane transition. Uh, that, that, that is when the torques of the, of the J2 and Sun are comparable, and the, the moon in, in, uh, acquires huge inclination. That this is inclination to the equator. And then just the whole thing falls back in. Uh, this is the same major axis. Goes, goes to the, about the transition and falls back in. And this is with the initial obliquity of 80 degrees. So maybe this is too big, but how about uh, closer to home? So this is a paper by Dan Tamayo. Uh, studying the same thing at Uranus. This is outward migration, sorry, inward migration of dust falling in at Uranus. Uranus has obliquity of 92 degrees. And when this circular dust comes close to the Laplace plane uh, transition, which is, as I said, where J2 and solar influences are equal, the, the orbits go wild. So it's the same phenomenon. Uh, so what we did was write an integrator where we had a full description of instantaneous tides of Earth-Moon system and put, uh, put Earth at high obliquity, evolve Moon outward, and see what happens. We started with a fast-spinning Earth, like we did in our 2012 paper. So um, you move out. This first part, when you move out fast, you can't even see. But then Earth gets stuck and it has these features like crashes and so on. Um, and th then there are two... Uh, there are two branches of the evolution. We changed tidal parameters for these two to see what happens with different tidal parameters. But this is the angle of momentum. Uh, it also in natural units. So you can see it, it drops quite a bit in, in this phase. Uh, and this is the eccentricity. Throughout this region where Earth is uh, pretty much stuck at the same distance, the eccentricity is maintained at 0.1 or 0.2. And that's the reason Earth is stuck, because uh, solar perturbations at the Laplace plane transition, transition are inducing eccentricity, which then produces uh, eccentricity tides which push Moon inward and arrest the evolution. This is inclination relative to the ecliptic. It starts in close to the obliquity. These two are close, but then uh, you can see that this line gets much thicker than the obliquity because the Moon acquires inclination relative to the equator, which later becomes inclination relative to the ecliptic while the obliquity is lowered, and you can see, because these two branches are different in the end, that the uh, tidal parameters we use for Earth at the later stages of evolution depend, uh, determine how low obliquity you can have in the end. Here we end up with, with obliquity somewhere below 20 degrees, which is what we need at that point to evolve where we are now. So if you start out with a, with a 70 degree, um, it's here, yeah, here. Obliquity Earth, you can lose angular momentum and you can inquire, acquire a large inclination. And it's a very complex sequence of events. Um, so first I'll show you a movie. So you start with the, so this is Earth and this is uh, the spin axis. We are seeing this from gamma point, the vernal equinox. So first the moon is in the, um, in the equatorial plane, but when it gets to about one million years, I'll speed up a bit, then it starts acquiring large inclination relative to Earth, and you can see it's all over the place and gets extracited too, and induces large notation in Earth because uh, now they, they mutually precess uh, with large uh, amplitudes. And as time goes on, you can see the orbit is really not growing. It's precessing all over the place, but it doesn't get any bigger. You can see that the median plane shifts to the ecliptic, which is the horizontal plane. Now it precesses around the ecliptic, and at this point evolution, Earth is straightening up. 
due to the interaction with the moon. So it's the first part is the moon losing again momentum and being stuck, and the second part is Earth straightening up. And end angle momentum is close to the present. Uh, we have to take projected angle momentum because once we lose lunar inclination in the Cassini state transition, we're gonna basically end up with a projected momentum because some of it is gonna be lose, lost in inclination damping. So this is the end state, uh, pretty much, with a low obliquity and lunar orbit is still inclined, but that's okay because we know it has to be inclined so it would damp afterwards. Um, it's pretty long, okay. Yeah, as I said, this is all seen from vernal equinox. The, so m m Earth is always pointing that way. The, um, so the first part of evolution, do you want to play it again or is it? Okay. So the, mm -hmm. so it's true they always end up with someone close Yes, because eventually it, eventually it goes beyond Cassini, uh, Laplace plane transition. Unless the obliquity is so high that it crashes back. I'll show a little bit of that. Th there are some, if you start with obliquity close to 90 degrees, the moon would actually fall back on Earth. But as, as long as it passes out by uh, past Laplace plane transition, its Laplace plane is going to be ecliptic. So it's going to precess around the ecliptic. Yeah, uh, damping, yeah, damping happens as long. Any, any uh, yes, yeah, and the exact timing depends on the shape of the moon. So what, everything I'll, ta I'll say about the uh, later damping of inclination depends on the precession rates of the moon and that therefore requires its present shape, but it's pr probably true. Okay, so this is the first part of evolution where angular momentum is lost. And you can see the argument of perigee uh, here that's relative to the uh, ecliptic. So the, pl the, uh, the Reference fermion is ecliptic, although that's not the only plane that matters really here. So you can see that eccentricity and inclination do darkness things. And uh, for every eccentricity cycle, you seem to have three inclination cycles. So they're stuck in some kind of uh, quasi resonance. So eccentricity does this, then comes there, and then makes a circle, then comes here. So it's aperiodic. So this is what. This is what this is. It comes here, then this part is when it makes a small circle, then goes back to the other island, makes a small circle, and so on. And this is a closed, uh, closed trajectory in parameter space. So it's some kind of secular resonance that's quasi-like. And in that, in that state, um, uh, the, the moon is stuck. And since so solar perturbations are inducing eccentricity, that means the angular momentum is lost from the system. Um, now, the later on, towards the end of the simulation, you have a different kind of secular resonance. Uh, and you can see the eccentricity has this periodicity that's a few thousand years, and it's clearly dominated by this argument. And that argument is, uh, in, involves uh, the longitude of lunar orbit, um, the uh, argument of perigee, and the longitude of vernal equinox. So it's basically a secular resonance between the precession of lunar orbit and precession of Earth's axis. Uh, and that's why it can straighten up the Earth's axis. Uh, and you, so you have the sequence of secular resonances that happen. It, just as it passes one, the phase space is so rich, it gets stuck to another. So every time we do it with slightly different parameters, we get generally the same effects, but we don't always get the same resonances doing it. So we did it with um, uh, different cues for Earth. We started out with a less dissipative Earth, which took a longer time, obviously. Uh, but we still get huge uh, damping of uh, loss of momentum, although not as much. So that to start to lose momentum, you want to have dissipative Earth early on and to, uh, to damp um, ob obliquity, you want less dissipative Earth uh, later on. So we haven't managed to get exactly where we are with the same set of parameters. But the trends are such that, that more dissipative Earth means uh, more angular momentum lost, but when you're lowering obliquity, you want less dissipation. Can you remind us that in the units you're plotting where the present 
systems I have uh, uh, The bottom here. Yeah, so, so we are a bit too much. Uh, about. And then when we start with a different, um, uh, with different uh, obliquities here, 80, 70, and 60. Uh, sorry, this is 75, 65, and 80. Uh, before, what I showed was 70. Um, you can see that generally, uh, angular momentum uh, loss is proportional to obliquity. So the, the lowest obliquity has the least loss. And in the uh, case with 80 degree obliquity, you actually go beyond, be, like crash because lunar orbit falls back onto Earth. Uh, because the moon just loses too much angular momentum during Laplace plane transition and falls back onto Earth. And that's what Atobe and Ida showed before. So the, for this to work, moon had to be somewhere in this range of 70, 60, 65, 70, or 75 degrees. Kind of. And then depending on the exact uh, uh, tidal properties, and also we try different initial spins. If you start with more spin, then you typically need to lose more angular momentum, which is easy. So um, it's, these take a long time. These take months to run. So um, we haven't nearly explored the full phase space. OK, so this was the part about Laplace plane transition, which is the transition of lunar orbit from orbits dominated by uh, equatorial, equatorial J2 to those dominated by solar perturbations. Now I'm talking about the other kind of transition, which is transition of lunar spin axis from being on one side of the ecliptic to being on the other side. So that from precessing faster than the orbit to precessing less. So since we have this integrator, which by the way also tracks lunar spin axis, we looked at the transition in, in uh, detail. So in analytical, uh, in analytical calculations, there is a sharp transition. This is what it looks numerically. You have one state that's the green, the other state is blue. So this is for different inclinations. Depending on the inclination, you can get forced, uh, forced uh, obliquity of the moon, put it in one state or the other, or neither. Actually, at the boundary, I find a large chaotic region um, where the moon is prefers not to be synchronous because the forced obliquity is so large that it's more energetically, uh, uh, it's more energetically stable to be slightly subsynchronous. Um, so that's interesting and hasn't been found before, but this hasn't been done numerically before. But generally, uh, th this lasts only a few Earth radii and eventually if you start out in Cassini state one and move out across it, you end up in Cassini state two. And this is what uh, obliquities look like for different initial incl inclinations. So inclinations of 5, 10, 15, 20 degrees. So the blue dashed lines are analytical expectations. And uh, the, the magenta and red lines are equ equivalent numerical simulations. So they follow each other up to the transition, where they do all kinds of weird things. These very high obliquities are in this non-synchronous state. And then they rejoin here. In the end, they're all rejoined. And one reason why you have this chaotic state is that you cannot have Cassini state above 58 degrees. Uh, there's an ancient paper um, uh, from Soviet Union that shows that, that nobody knows about. But actually, it's, the, it's, really, uh, it's really simple to show. So you can see that none of them rejoin Cassini state 2 until the Cassini state uh, uh, obliquity is below 58 degrees, and then numerical and analytical can rejoin each other. So the anal analytical curves going above 58 degrees are invalid. They cannot work. And then on this side, you have some secondary resonances causing chaos. Why are these distinctly jumping between analytic solutions? Uh, so th there, there are three kind of states. They can the are jumping. Oh, the, the, so these are jumping because up to here is Cassini state 1, and here it's 2. Right-hand side, mm -hmm. you've got four tracks, and the numerical solutions are very distinctly landing on the tracks, right? The, yeah. Like, why is why is that? Well, these are the same. These are the four inclinations: five, uh, ten, fifteen, twenty. So when they fall on the track, that means that they're in Cassini state. And when they're off the track, that means they're in some in some non-synchronous state, typically, or cha chaotic. Sometimes they never settle. I have them. I have the moon doing crazy things. Yeah, until I guess what looks weird is that. It, like the, the purple circles, they yeah. end up in one state. Yeah. Before that, they sort of explore being very close to one of the other analytic solutions. Oh. Uh, Why are they attracted to the other analytic solutions? It's not real. It's, they're, they're on, like, they just look the same, but actually it's, uh, they're non-synchronous. So they're not seeing the same state. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, OK, so this is what we get with actual numeric integration. Um, we have to speed up. So what I showed you before was semi-analytical, which assumed Cassini state. But as you can see, if things are chaotic at the boundary, we have to do boundary properly. Um, so we can speed up things outside of the Cassini state um, and um, outside of the boundary. So what we have here is that we found this resonance, which we had to go, co go across very slowly. So that's the blue part, where we actually go slowly across the resonance, which kicks, things, kicks the moon outside of the Cassini state before it even comes to the boundary. I should explain that what I did here uh, was put things in non-synchronous rotation. So this is not a question if Cassini state is stable, but if Cassini state is the stable end state of evolution. So that's different from if you start out in Cassini state and migrate in this region. So sometimes you can have objects that are start out here, move into the chaotic region, but as long as they are they start out within the resonant island, they can still be resonant for a while. While this plot just shows that if they start out in this chaotic region, they would not re-enter resonant island if perturbed. But for the real evolution, we really care what the real moon evolving would have done. And there is this interesting resonance at 29 uh, Earth radii, which kicks it out of the of the synchronous rotation. And by now, it's in the region where it would not go back. So for a while, it's non-synchronous and follows this curve, which is not a Cassini state. Uh, so this is what Cassini state would be. That's black for obliquity. And this other curve is not. And you can see that also for the spin rate. This is synchronous spin. And this, this resonance kicks it out of the synchronous. And it settles into non-synchronous, which asymptotically rejoins synchronous when you get away from the, uh, from the uh, transition. And what this, uh, what this um, resonance is, um, is that at this point, the free libration frequency of the moon is one year. So the sun has a strong effect on lunar, uh, on lunar uh, libration. So that breaks, breaks the synchronous uh, rotations uh, in, for a short time. Uh, yeah, I, I show that here, that you can see the uh, non-principal axis uh, component of the spin or elevation angle get bigger and bigger as you approach the resonance. And then once the moon is kicked out, this is zoomed in, you, you break the elevation angle. And, and the, moon, the moon just spins around every which way. Um, but the important part is by, uh, by using a very, uh, very reasonable so the average Q for Earth over the age of the, uh, of the system and Q of the moon, which is actually less dissipative than it is now. We, we start with 30 degrees that we get in the end of the Laplace plane simulation. And we end up with about 10 degrees, which is what we need uh, from the semi-analytical. Because this is the hairy part. This is the part where we have Cassini same transition and we have to do numerically. What I showed you before is uh, that was a semi-analytical approach. It works just fine be beyond 40 uh, Earth radii. And now Moon is at 60. So as long as by simulating Cassini state transition, we get to inclination of 10 degrees at 40 radii, we can say we are good. Because that's where we need to be to evolve to the present state. Uh, because once you don't have transitions, you can assume Cassini states and analytical works just fine. So this is consistent with the present orbit. It's consistent with our simulations of the, of the Laplace plane transition, and it's consistent with the present orbit. Um, so, uh, so this is it, basically. The, um, the moon seems to be derived from Earth's mantle, and that's not what the original giant impact predicted. And uh, the past lunar inclination must have been higher than people thought. And this really is a new thing. People haven't realized that despite working on the problem for 50 years. Um, and the best way to explain that, we think, is that if you had very different initial conditions than people usually think, that was a high obliquity, uh, fast-spinning Earth. And first, you go through a Laplace plane transition um, that where Moon loses angular momentum, induces inclination, and lowers Earth's obliquity. And then the second stage is the, the Cassini state transition um, of the Moon, where the lunar inclination is damped, so we end up with a system that it is now, with like, noticeable but low inclination moon and relatively low obliquity Earth. Thank you.
apply the match to present angle of yeah. of your human system, mm -hmm. what three parameters are you able to adjust or what do you need to adjust? Or is there a prediction actually? Well, much of it has to do with the with the total parameters of the Earth and the Moon long time ago. So it's really very hard to it's constrain. Cubes, right? Yeah. Yeah, we are using lab numbers of the order one. We assume that at the time of Laplace plane transition, those are fluid bodies. Those are behaving as fluid bodies. Um, and uh, we get them to be around 100 or 200 for our simulation. It's sometimes the ratio that matters, but we like to keep them on the low side so we can integrate faster. So that limits our approach somewhat. But uh, the, only, the only thing that really we need to tweak a bit is that the, the beginning and the end Q cannot be exactly the same because we can't get either the right angle momentum or the right, uh, or the right uh, obliquity for Earth. However, um, we tried a relatively small number of initial conditions. And we can see some trends with, because our initial obliquity is completely arbitrary. We need high obliquity. But seven, why 70? Why not 72 and a half? You know, we, um, and uh, also our initial spins are a bit arbitrary. We, should, we, should, we tried higher spins too, and it's, it, they, they damn just fine. The, um, it's, it's much less predictable than the evection resonance, uh, let's put it that way. So we really have to do it numerically. Yeah. Well, I'm curious the impact. Yeah. Actually, this, your impact is much less massive than the other models. That was, uh, OK, excellent. I have a, uh, I have a slide on that. So I showed you how we solved the problem in 2012. This is a work by Simon Locke, who's a student with Sarah Stewart. Um, so he shows here the structure of the disk in um, canonical impact and, uh, and uh, fast spinning Earth impact. So here, Earth is almost falling apart. And atmosphere uh, and a disk are continuous and a band is for a disk. And here, disk is faster than the atmosphere. Think about it. If Earth is spinning slower than Keplerian, the atmosphere is going to be slower than the disk. And, and Earth could absorb the moon, eat up the moon, and would spin once every four hours, right? And it was still not full. No. So there was always a problem with communication between disk and Earth in the classical model, because if you mix up material, moon can just fall onto Earth. Consider angular momentum, and every, every, like moon can just go away. It's not it has to. Well, you can decrease the innermost parts, <coughs> but you won't generally decrease the outermost parts. Without uh, you might lose too much material, but if you add all of the angular momentum to Earth, Earth would not fall apart because what we think are usually about Keplerian disk, they have to spread because if some mass goes in, some mass has to carry angular momentum out. But Earth can be large enough sink, because if the spin is five hours, Earth's break, breakup spin is only an hour and a half. So actually, Earth could, like, you can just throw the moon in, and moon, Earth would absorb it. Oh, but once you have the disk, you can just throw all that mass into the central gravitating object. Some has to go out. There's Some has to go out, but that means that you cannot have a, there were there, there are proposals that to mix the disk with the mantle. Well, this actually gets to the question of when the Earth's isotope uh, ratios are being measured. Yeah. What range of depth is one effectively probing in the mantle? Is, is one underlying the fact that the mantle has been mixing over the history of the Earth? Well, these are, I think these come from MORBs, which are, uh, th th these are how, basalts that come from the centers of, of ocean basins. So they're the, the most primitive mantle material. So yes, there could be a lower mantle that's separate from the upper mantle. But apart from that, which is unresolved question, it should be well mixed. Like you, you are really sampling a big chunk of Earth. And lo lower mantle might or might not be distinct. But, but I'm not sure how this answer Oh, well, it's the question that. In, in this case, the, there is a continuous, like the, there, there is no break in dynamical regime between mantle and, uh, and the disk. So you have a, well, Sarah doesn't like that term, but you have a continuous fission in operation, kind of. There, there is no, the, the, the mantle, atmosphere, and disk are the same thing. 
continuous, and you can have mixing. So actually, this removes the requirement that this has to be originally made from Earth material. You can have some equilibration between. Oh, I, I don't know if you can say from this, but what I'm saying is that just apart from high, high uh, angular momentum impact being able to eject Earth material, even after the disk forms, it, it might be much, much easier, it might be possible for a disk to be still in communication with Earth's mantle and exchanging material, as opposed to the classical one where the, uh, you know, if stuff goes in, it will just get stuck in. There is no reason it has to go out. Yeah? Sorry. It yeah. increases the impact velocity 20 grams per second. That was just one solution that worked for us. The yeah, you're not because there is another problem with the Earth Moon problem, which is that you really have a problem of the Earth. The Earth Moon acquires an object of this way, just for large, you know, kind of like. So you have a smaller projector shooting in that will help. I don't, I, I don't know if that's really a problem. Well, yeah, and so Well, it depends what orbit it was on before. Yeah, uh, no, because, because if there is. If... Yeah. yeah. So that's not Yeah, so uh, what I'm saying is that the, if you want to do it through the impact and eject Earth material into orbit, you need to have advantageous impact parameter and conditions for the impact. Like the best thing is to hit, to have impactor go against rotation of, prior rotation of Earth. So that it's very hard for material, for the impactor to go into orbit, but easier for Earth material to go. Um, but if you have a fast spinning Earth after the impact, you can have, uh, you, you can have actually earth material mixing in with disk material after the fact. Well, uh, and this is all vapor, by the way. It's not like it's so hot that most of the material is in the vapor. And that's also a thing with a, with a high momentum impact. It is more vapor, which allows for more mixing. Yeah? So <clears throat> has anybody considered the, the possibility in a giant impact theory of there being two equal mass? Yes. Objects, so like one, one, two and a half Earths, they have a grazing, it's, grazing it's like Yes, that was the paper. Then, yes, that was the paper by Robin Canop. So our paper had dynamics and a giant impact, and for complicated reasons, it ended up being back to back with the other paper, which had same, they relied on, on my mechanism to losing a momentum, but. That, uh, that was the Canop paper? Canop paper, that's right. The same time, it's the same issue, back to back. So. Okay. No, they had. They also had high momentum, but there was a slow, a slow collision between two large bodies, like half Earth, and then problem is symmetric in that case, and you end up with. So that, so that, that solves the uh, composition problem. Right? So you have two things. Yeah, that but that, that's. Equal mass and everything will mix. And then that would solve. Uh, you can't have that with the present angular momentum because. Uh, even if they come in at V infinity zero, there will be too much angular momentum. So you have to lose angular momentum for that, which is what Robin proposed. However, objection I've seen to that solution uh, is that gen, like the terrestrial planet formation uh, simulations don't see something like that that late, because there are ways of dating using isotopes, Earth, Moon, collision, uh, formation, and just mer very slow mergers. You, it, it's just not dynamically what's seen, but. It, it's unusual. It's just the parameters of the impact. I've seen Nate Cabe and other people like, put those parameters versus the, what they see in their simulations. And that just doesn't. It's not to say that what we are predicting is super uh, frequent, but you know, the. It only has to happen once. Yeah, it has to happen only once. Um, yeah, but so th that was the main argument against that. That just the, that equal, equal merger is unlikely. But. So this is uh, this is the choice collision out of many possible ones that can form the moon. But mm -hmm. you infer that there are other ones that happen, but didn't happen to form the moon. But nevertheless, there are other giant impacts. Well, we have Venus. We don't know what happened there. Um, actually. 
since this high obliquity behavior is a good way of losing your momentum, people have said maybe something like that happened on Venus, but the moon crashed back in, or never was a moon, or who knows what will happen. Yeah, people have proposed, like, now you, you really have open, open phase space there because there's no moon. But, um, but I think that the general rule that, that the spins of terrestrial planets are more evolved than you think, that we are not seeing really a primordial thing. And, that, uh, and yeah, and everything had a giant impact except, except apparently Mars, which seems to be, because its core formed very early and doesn't have fast spin, seems to be one of the embryos that they, they form uh, oligarchically and then didn't really hit anything really big. <laughs>